this field, aren't you? Yes. Welcome, Christophe Gilberg. For many years you have been a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry from the University of Gothenburg. And your speech is about at least 10 different yeah. psychiatric disorders. Yeah. The stage yeah. is yours. And Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and if you can see on the slides here, it sounds as though this is going to be a totally confusing uh, expedition uh, where we're going to be speaking about all sorts of things in under 35 minutes. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I think it's time for some kind of uh, rethinking about pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome in terms of the fact that it maybe not it is even pediatric. It could be that it's uh, at least young adults, it could be even uh, older people, perhaps. And so I think I propose that we call it dance instead. Uh, <laughs> devastating or dramatic, because the, the thing about the onset thing, uh, I think is very important. That's how we all, who work with the pants on a daily basis, as it were, uh, we conceive of it as something that's very dramatic and it's a devastating change in the life of the child and the family. So maybe the D rather than the P, uh, not pediatric but dramatic, uh, acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome. Um, and I'm going to be speaking a little bit about encephalitis, regressive autism, RFID as we've already heard about, OCD, Tourette, Klein, Levin syndrome, psychosis, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, catatonia, multi essence and Munchausen by proxy. So, let's go. As one of my Japanese colleagues usually say, he says, okay, let's go. Uh, but before I go there, I, I would like to, for those of you who have never heard about essence before, many of the Swedish uh, participants would have heard uh, endlessly about essence over the past 10 years. But 10 years ago I launched this concept, Early Symptomatic Syndromes Eliciting Neurodevelopmental Clinical Examinations. Uh, and of course you can't go on saying that, so essence sounds a bit better. But essence comprises all sorts of neurodevelopmental disorders that actually all of which overlap with each other. The essence comprises ADHD with or without a positional defiant disorder and it affects about at least 5% of the general population of both kids and adults. Speech and language delay, speech and language disorder or language disorder or specific language impairment, which by the way is never specific, it also affects about 5% of the general population, very often, as it were, comorbid with ADHD and even more comorbid with developmental coordination disorder, which in itself also presents in about 5% of all kids. And then there's intellectual disability, which is at least 2% of the general population, uh, and scarily enough, it will probably increase over the next uh, several decades if the current trend of the decreasing IQ will continue uh, across the planet. Um, and then there's autism, uh, which everybody talks about today as that's the most prevalent, that's increasing. Everybody thinks autism is so interesting and so mysterious. Uh, but actually, autism isn't increasing uh, as far as we're concerned. We've studied it in the Swedish Twin Study, in the registers. It's only in the registers that it goes up. The number of autistic symptoms in the general Swedish population hasn't changed at all over the past 15 years. The number of ADHD symptoms have increased a tiny little bit, but not even significantly. But the rate of diagnosed ADHD has gone dramatically. So we are changing our concepts of when to diagnose conditions. And we hear all these things about how young people have such poor health, mental health in particular. Do you really believe it? I, for one, I don't. I don't believe that all young people are now so much worse off when it comes to mental health. But it has become very popular to say, you have a right to be happy every day. And so, of course, if you're not happy every day, you have poor mental health. I wasn't happy every day of my life. I don't consider myself to have very poor mental health. Anyway, I, I won't go into it uh, more at this time. 
But I think it's important for everyone to stop thinking that everything has increased. Maybe PANS is increasing because it ha actually has been overlooked. Uh, but that's the same to an extent with autism and several other conditions. Uh, but we're much more prone to diagnose a number of conditions than we were only 10, 15 years ago. We've already heard about uh, ARFID uh, and tick disorders and selecting mutism and uh, extreme demand or pathological demand avoidance, all closely related. Uh, and even reactive attachment disorder. Everybody thinks reactive attachment disorder is nothing to do with neurodevelopment. When we finally did a study in Scotland, uh, we found that all children with reactive attachment disorder also had another essence type problem. Uh, so it's also very related to neurodevelopmental disorders. And when we looked at children who have been maltreated in the Swedish registries and in the Swedish twin study, we find that children who have been maltreated have much higher rates of essence than children who have not been maltreated. But when we expose it to the twin design, we find it's more than 95% accounted for by genetic factors. So maltreatment is very often a sign of an essence problem running in the family. Uh, I'm not saying that all the problems come from the genetic, genetic problems, but it's definitely the case that we should start re-looking at children who are diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder and give them some credit, as it were, for having real uh, neuropsychiatric problems as well as their inflicted problems. Uh, and they need even more help than other kids uh, from psychiatrists and from psychologists and education people. Now, if you take any one of these disorders, ADHD, autism, etc., and look into the future. We've done that in a number of studies over the years. And you'll find, well, they all predict academic failure, they all predict other school adjustment problems, social exclusion. Very many of them, in particular ADHD with ODD, predicts substance use, psychiatric disorders, including depression, anxiety, personality disorders, eating disorders, you name it. Um, but that's when you take one uh, at a time and say, this is a group of ADHD. It, it will develop like this. This is a group with uh, anorexia. It will develop like this. Nobody in the past has looked at the typical thing, which is this, these are children who don't have one disorder. All of them have more than one disorder. We heard before from Daniel uh, about the comorbidity and the, the fact that <laughs> some kids even had it met criteria for 11, or adults met criteria for 11 different diagnoses. It's the rule, if you have ADHD, if you have autism, if you have language disorder, if you have DCD, if you have selective mutism or a tick disorder, you have more than that. You have at least one more disorder. It's almost 100% certain. We know that in children under age 5, that if you make a diagnosis of autism under age 5, it can only happen in children who have other problems as well. If you only have a high autism score and nothing else, you don't come to see a doctor even, or a psychologist, because people perceive you as bright or whatever, but they don't perceive you as very functionally disabled. It's only when autism occurs in the context of these other things that it becomes a very disabling condition. So that's the background for what I'm going to say now. Everybody has now from now on to believe, in essence, and also believe what I'm saying, that it's always comorbid. But the word comorbid is not a good one because these are individual children who have all of the things at one time. They don't just have autism, they also have a language disorder or an ADHD problem or an OCD or a tick disorder. And it's not really comorbidity, it's the same child, the same child's brain, and it all sits within that same child's brain. So here's um, more for the actual title of uh, my presentation. I think one of the first cases ever described of pandas was of course described by myself. Uh, and it was in 1918 when I published a case of a young girl with mycoplasma and cephalitis in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders. She seemed to present with what at the time we felt was more like a schizophrenic-like condition, but it was a very acute onset, 
and she had a lot of tics, she had a lot of OCD, it's all in the paper, but at that time this was like schizophrenia form psychosis. And it took a number of months uh, for us to actually go back to her old specimens from cerebrospinal fluid and blood and find out that she actually had uh, an encephalitis caused by mycoplasma uh, infection. I'm pretty sure today it would have been diagnosed as pandas. And another case that, of course, myself uh, published uh, in 1985 is about a boy with Asperger's syndrome and recurrent psychosis, at the time thought of as manic depressive psychosis. And when you look at that case study, in, also in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders, you see it was very acute onset. He had always had Asperger's syndrome, and then suddenly, uh, uh, at the age of 14, he developed all sorts of other problems, which it initially was felt to be a manic episode, and then he became extremely depressed, and then, etc., etc., and then actually revealed that he had both tics and OCD type problems, uh, but of course, pandas wasn't around, so it had to have another name at the time. And what about the Klein Levin syndrome? Everybody knows, of course, what that is. Maybe nobody knows what it is. Yeah, I don't, still don't think we know what it really is, but it's a disorder which usually has an episodic course uh, and uh, acute onset of usually uh, the combination of overeating and sleepiness, plus a number of other major psychiatric problems. Very often, these young, usually boys, are perceived to be psychotic, uh, have enormous amounts of OCD and tics, uh, but the, the OCD and tics are played down in the case descriptions. Instead, uh, the overeating and the enormous amount of uh, extra sleep needed is uh, taken to the forefront, and so we call it Klein Levin syndrome. I'm pretty convinced that a number of cases diagnosed with Klein Levin syndrome, if people were to look at them more carefully, they would now say, is it this really pants? And what about teenage psychosis? <coughs> Acute onset bipolar disorder. We did a study uh, in the 1980s of all children who had psychosis with adolescent onset in the region of Gothenburg. This was a population-based study, so all cases. And when you go back to the tables in that publication from the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry, you'll find uh, a number of indications telling you that, oh, clearly several of these cases must have been what we now would refer to as pants. And Heller dementia, uh, disintegrative disorder, disintegrative autism or regressive autism, what about those cases? When I was at NYU a number of years ago, uh, a number of people, uh, Ed Kalavnia and myself, published this case on Hella dementia, uh, which is a sort of forerunner of regressive autism. It was described in 1908 by Theodore Heller, uh, and uh, these are children who develop normally up until about two, three, four, five years of age, and then suddenly develop over a week or so uh, into something that everybody would say, oh, this is autism, why hasn't people told this family that this is autism? Well, two weeks before, he didn't have autism. Uh, and uh, this is a category that was in uh, all the previous versions of the DSM uh, and called variously disintegrative psychosis, childhood disintegrative psychosis, or disintegrative disorder. Um, it should be called Heller dementia because it was Heller who described it and it looks the same as when he described it a hundred years ago. Anyway, nowadays it would be called autism spectrum disorder with regression. So, if we look uh, at Kiki's and Susan's uh, and others' uh, PANS criteria, uh, again, uh, they actually do stress that it is dramatic, acute and dramatic. Um, and what about some cases of so called garden variety of OCD and Tourette syndrome? At least in the past, I've seen a number of cases, like 10, 12 year olds who had acute onset of tics and OCD, and he always called it tics with OCD or Tourette syndrome. But of course now, 
knowing what we do today, I'm pretty sure I would have to re-diagnose a number of those cases. Um, and then there's the long list that you've seen several times today of you have to have two or more of these other things. But all of those other things usually apply in cases with regressive autism. So anxiety is very typical of regressive autism. Emotional ability and depression are very common in regressive autism. Irritability and opposition behavior is very common. Uh, and behavioral regression is part of the diagnosis. Deterioration in school or preschool performance, yes. And sensory motor abnormalities always present in the regressive autism, as are various kinds of sleep disturbances, aneurysis, urinary frequency problems. And so, why isn't it regressive autism? Why is it pants or vice versa? So here is the almost extensive list of everything you have to think of all the time when you evaluate the child or an adult with a question mark, uh, could this be pants? Regressive autism and disintegrative disorder in children under about four years of age should be, if it's acute, if it meets all the criteria for pants, should we call it pants or regressive autism? landau kleffner syndrome, I haven't spoken about it specifically, but that's another of the syndromes where you could well argue, well, it should end up under the pants uh, umbrella. Uh, these are kids who usually develop relatively or quite normally up until the age of about four or five, uh, maybe even up to six years, and then uh, develop suddenly loss of uh, uh, understanding spoken language. So over a period of a few days, they lose the ability to understand what people tell them. And they appear to be extremely confused. And then gradually, over the next week or so, they lose the ability to you know, have expressive language themselves and become extremely upset, usually autistic, maybe with epileptic seizures, but maybe not. But if you do an EEG, you'll find various typical abnormalities usually in the EEG. Uh, Brian Neville and I have seen over the years a number of such cases in London and we've seen a number of cases here in, in Sweden as well. Uh, and very often you get the sense that they all have epilepsy, but they don't always have clinical seizures at all. Uh, and it's very difficult to say should we call it regressive autism or landau kleffner syndrome. And depending on age, somebody would then say, well, I think this is an ESIS syndrome or a continuous spike wave uh, activity during slow sleep syndrome, CSWS, which is a very closely related type of problem in children, um, usually developing a little later than typical landau kleffner syndrome. Elizabeth Fernell and I have discussed over the years whether it's not time now to look at all these conditions, regressive autism, landau kleffner syndrome, uh, CSWS, uh, that's continuous spike wave activity during slow sleep, which means you have epileptic phenomena in the EEG uh, during slow sleep. Uh, and it's not going to be discovered unless you do a full sleep EEG. Uh, and then also uh, linking it to PANS thinking, aren't these just presentations of the same thing happening at different times in a child's development? Um, so, uh, I mentioned the klein Lennon syndrome, which I think also should be always thought about when you have acute onset psychiatric disorders in uh, young people. And of course, we all know that you have to think about other forms of encephalitis, uh, and you have to rule them out uh, in order to not make a hasty diagnosis, say, of PANS. And we've heard that bipolar disorder can definitely present in a way which would make PANS a very real possibility to consider. But also that bipolar, dis exists, bipolar disorder exists without PANS. We've seen a number of cases with episodic catatonia with very acute onset and very devastating problems uh, and, and extremely functionally disabling problems. And some of them definitely would meet criteria for PANS, but is it the right way to 
move forward? Uh, or should we instead start thinking, could this not be catatonia per se? Uh, and of course, again, the whole essence uh, problem arises because we start looking at the individual with severe catatonia and you say, oh, well, there's a lot of autism here, there's a lot of OCD here, there's a lot of tics here as well. And of course, a number of cases that we refer to as schizophrenia are clearly, at least in my book, real, real pants cases. Mary Coleman and I wrote a book 23 years ago called uh, The Schizophrenias, um, where we went through the literature at that time looking for biological markers for uh, schizophrenia and finding a number of uh, metabolic and uh, inflammatory disorders at that time in the 1990s that clearly were associated with schizophrenia. And of course you all know about the link between influenza, virus during pregnancy and, and schizophrenia, etc. So I think it's high time that people working in adult psychiatry started thinking again about their so-called cases of classic schizophrenia. Uh, I'm also interested, it's, I think it's very interesting to, to say that um, we have found in studies of 30-year-olds with autism and or Asperger's syndrome, um, and comparing them with uh, children with, or 30-year-olds with schizophrenia, so the 30-year-olds, uh, uh, 50 to 60 individuals with the childhood diagnosis of autism or Asperger's syndrome were followed up at 30 years of age. Not one of them met criteria for schizophrenia. But in the group diagnosed with schizophrenia after the age of 50, uh, when we looked at them at 30 years of age, about half of them met full criteria according to retrospective interviews for autism in childhood. What does that tell you? Well, I think the only way to interpret it uh, is to say very likely the diagnosis of autism and or Asperger's syndrome at a young age reduced stress and maybe inflammation in children who got the diagnosis of autism, but in those others who actually did have a diagnosis or a problem of autism but who were never properly diagnosed in childhood, they were exposed to such extreme stress and maybe infections and inflammation in the teenage years that they developed what people call schizophrenia. And I've already mentioned about a variety of OCD and Tourette's syndrome, and Sinan's career, of course, everyone's heard about already, so I'm not going to go into that, other than to say that we're actually very interested in a group we have in Glasgow, uh, where uh, suddenly a new cohort of Sinan's Korea developed after the general practitioners in Glasgow stopped using antibiotics uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, and then uh, suddenly there are uh, more than 20 new cases of classic Sydenham's Korea uh, in an area of Glasgow. And we're looking at them and they look very much from the point of view of their psychiatric problems, uh, like what we now refer to as PANS or PANDAS. So, if this is the case, that the differential diagnosis is actually quite difficult, uh, can we really go on saying that, well, this is something for a pediatrician or a general practitioner or the non-specialist psychiatrist uh, or a speech and language therapist or an OT or a physiotherapist? I think not. I think it's very high time that all of us who are interested in the field make it possible for people to come to clinics where there are a team of experts and not accept that this is something up that I should have to just, uh, you know, on my own as a parent or an individual uh, look out for the best possible treatment uh, and look around the world to get it. There is a need for the uh, team of pants or dance uh, to uh, include at least a developmental psychiatrist. And I'm stressing developmental psychiatrists because many adult psychiatrists around the globe have no training in development whatsoever. And this is not something that people want to talk about, but it's true. And if you don't have any understanding of the growing child, I, I can't see really how you can work with this type of problem. But the same holds uh, in other places for some child psychiatrists. There are even some child psychiatrists who don't really have 
uh, and training in development. So a developmental psychiatrist, not just any child or adult psychiatrist, a developmental neurologist uh, or a pediatrician with special training in neurology, or in some countries there's behavioral pediatrics, for instance. A developmental neuropsychologist is of the essence, always. A specialist nurse, um, an immunologist, a virologist, bacteriologist, depending on who's the best person around uh, to actually be involved in this. And then I think it's extremely important to have an established collaboration link with neurophysiology, neuroradiology, neurochemistry, and genetics, so that you can talk to your colleagues and discuss these cases in the team so that you don't miss out on a number of conditions that are actually very different from what you had expected from the beginning. So, and all of this should be done in the context of essence research. I think it's not okay to, to go on not doing follow-up studies uh, of these groups uh, and I'm pretty convinced that virtually all families and parents uh, and even the kids themselves uh, are interested to be part of good research so that you learn more about what, what can be accomplished and what can we achieve together. I think it's essential also that this team meets on a regular basis uh, and discuss all the new developments and of course like what's happening today. Um, I saw that somebody else has already shown this picture, so I'm not going to show it again. Um, but I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I hope that you're even more confused now than you are in the start. Thank you. We've heard so much about other teams that are actually doing all the wonderful yeah. things that we should be doing. But of course, but how? Yeah, well, yes, of course. But how are your proposition met in general? Do, well, do people listen to your to your recommendations? Well, yes, some yeah. people do. But I think, very unfortunately, in our country as well as in many other countries, there is this strange uh, new world, uh, not a brand new world, but a very strange new world where people who have no knowledge about this thing are the ones who decide. Yeah. Um, the like administrators the, in our uh, medical system, for instance, for instance <laughs> or people who have absolutely no knowledge about what we're talking about. And, and I think it's a shame and something that would have to change everywhere. The people who know more should be the ones to tell people and this is probably together with you know parent organizations etc uh, should tell the administrators it this is how we should do it yeah. not they come to us because uh, everywhere in healthcare system they are struggling with uh, with uh, weak resources so how can this be done well actually i don't think the resources are all that weak okay. but i think they're organized in such awful you know like silos everywhere so that there's, for instance, in our country, usually an organization for speech and language therapists, which is separate from pediatrics, which is separate from child psychiatry, which is separate from clinical genetics, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it's, uh, they should all be together in an essence, pants, dance type of team, where, where families could walk through one door and, you know, get the service there. Yes, because what we are talking about also, I think, uh, would uh, make a huge impact on, on treatment. And uh, I'm thinking about uh, what we in Sweden call social studies, uh, which <laughs> the board of health and welfare. Exactly, the board of health, uh, the, the, the national board yeah. of health and welfare. Uh, they they actually give recommendations. But, but in Sweden you are allowed, because we have 21 different uh, health regions, they are allowed to, to choose yeah. whatever they want and, and probably co cause... Uh, or, now I'm getting tired. Uh, because of the money, the, yeah. the lack of money, you choose always what is cheapest. Yeah. So what, uh, what do you think? At, at least at this stage in our country, I think it would be, uh, there would be probably room for two centers uh, working with 
pants dance or, or whatever, uh, and it shouldn't be organized in every you know, county. Mm -hmm. No. So what is your proposition? I know you well, have uh, one, two, or three, three. at the most teams yes. uh, that consisted of all these uh, experts. And what, what, again, I'm asking again, what, how are these propositions meant? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, usually it's people like some of the people here who understand, oh, maybe that's right. Uh, it's not the administrators and it's not the government. Yeah, and uh, to begin with, when, when, if my child is sick, I'm going to primary care from the beginning. I, I promise you, I will. You yeah, will, yeah, okay. will be able to go in five minutes. I know you have to go. Uh, and, and how is the knowledge among the, the in primary care when you meet the doctor? Not very good. So, but but I, I don't think primary care in itself is the problem. I think it's more a problem of things like, it, you know, some um, child psychiatric clinics, for instance, say we only take this and this and that, and we don't take these. Others say a very different thing. And why is that? Because there are all these local uh, guidelines that are developed. Okay. For all the different counties, there are different guidelines. And then uh, the National Board of Health and Welfare comes along and says, these are the national guidelines. And then they don't, they don't uh, apply with, uh, they don't comply with the regional or local guidelines. I think one of the biggest problems is this, that we probably, in our country, should get rid of all these extra levels like Lund's team. Mm -hmm. uh, Where they call the yeah, that's, that's, very, that's a political matter. Yes, it is. Yes. today. Anyway, uh, I don't know if this is the last question, but I, it probably is, because I would like to know, when you are talking about uh, all your experience and what you have seen and essence and so on, do you have any regrets, uh, you know, since there are so many people that, sh that probably have been misdiagnosed? Well, it's difficult to say regrets, um, but, but uh, definitely I realized with hindsight uh, that I missed a number of cases. But of course, at the time, we didn't know. Uh, but but I can't say, like, I, I you know, go and worry every day. No. Um, but one of the things that I do think is very sad is, I mean, a number of years ago, um, our group, uh, actually advocated very strongly for the development of school health uh, yeah. and for school health um, to be linked to neuropsychiatric services because uh, what you discover in schools uh, are all these problems that we talk about uh, and if there were good doctors, nurses and psychologists in, in school health everywhere they would definitely get enough uh, experience of yeah, you know, children with problems to know, oh, this, these are the kids that we should immediately... They discover it very at the same exactly. stage. But now instead, school health has been demantled. It's like almost nothing. And it's up to the headmaster to decide whether or not there should be in the school health, really. Yeah. Th that's, this a is, yeah, that's a Yeah, that's a reflection. And this is also political. So, uh, yeah, just start a new polit polit political party <laughs> or something. No, no. Uh, yes. Thank you very much.